Hey, good, good morning, oh, good afternoon, oh. good evening, wherever you may be. Scott Lude and Greg White with you here live on Supply Chain. Now, Greg, welcome to today's live stream, maybe from Kansas City today. I don't know, huh? No, not from Kansas City, but uh, repping Kansas City, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you, by the way. Good luck to you and all of Kansas City's fandom, kingdom, chiefdom, uh, as we approach the big game this coming Sunday. But speaking of big events, mm. today's live stream is almost going to be as big, Greg, huh? <laughs> For us in supply chain, it is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> well, so on this episode, we're going to be continuing a long-running popular quarterly series powered by our friends at U.S. Bank. Greg, we're going to be sharing key insights from one of the leading transportation industry resources, the U.S. Bank Freight Payment Index for Q4. 2023 folks you can download your copy for free at freight.usbank.com we'll drop that in the uh, comments in just a minute so you can beat it up dog ear it spill coffee on it mark it up and follow along right with us greg that's a, that's an important thing to do for today's the next hour isn't it hang it on the wall next to you yeah frame it you can you get a new one every quarter so it's kind of like when people used to use these things called calendars, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's such a valuable tool, right? I mean, of course it's not forward looking, but it is indicative of the future. My, much like anything that analyzes the past, there is some, some information about what you can find in the future. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, gosh, I mean, I, well, I'm, I love it when we bring on an, a practitioner or a service provider or somebody who gets to say, this is how we use this thing. Right. right. We've had some really great examples of of how companies use it. I think that's as important as the data is, itself is what you do with it. Well, and a good news, Greg, to your point, is we get our cake and eat it too. We got one perspective as always, focus heavily on what the data is showing, and then we're marrying that with another perspective, as well as our expertise, focus heavily on what's going on out in the marketplace. Yeah. So, Greg, one more thing before we bring on our two esteemed panelists here today. I think I our, know what you're going to ask me. <laughs> I hope so. Hey, context is powerful and yeah. really critical these days. Now, our longtime global audience members, surely they get the value of what we tackle here each quarter again, with our friends from U.S. Bank and executive practitioners from coast to coast. But for our newer audience members out there, Greg, hey, tell us more about the importance of this research and the data we're going to be covering today and the perspectives as we continue this yeah. popular series here at Supply Chain Now. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, Bobby Holland and his team analyze billions, 42 billions of dollars of data every year to put this, this analysis together. And you know, this thing, just since we started doing this, this thing's grown by over 50%. So it's a huge amount of data and growing, which makes it so representative of what's really happening in the marketplace out there. And um, this is what these companies use to, to determine what they've seen, how what they've seen could lend to what they might see coming in the future. And it's just, it, it's just a huge sample size relative to the marketplace. When you think about statistics, and analysis a lot of times it's tiny tiny fractions of data and then it's extrapolated like polls like political polls right those are usually about a thousand people right and there are about 60 to 90 million people that vote in in an election in the u.s so this is much much more representative of that which makes it ever so much more powerful and it's brought by uh brought to you by I'm going to call him Professor Holland because he is styling today. <laughs> well, let's so, get. And he looks like a professor. Let's do this. <laughs> well, what a great way to teeth this conversation up, Greg. Really important information we're going to be going over over the next hour. And big uh, welcome to everyone that's with us yeah. here for a lot of these shows from Josh and Emily and Ben, uh, Amanda and Catherine, all of y'all way in throughout the session, right? This is live and we'd welcome y'all's comments. So to Greg's, his final comment there. We have two wonderful guests uh, with us here today. I want to welcome in Bobby Holland, Director, Freight Business Analytics at U.S. Bank, and Eric Olson, Sales Support Operations Director with Total Quality Logistics. Hey, hey, Bobby, how you doing? 
good, good. Professor good Holland, as Greg has Lee deemed you, dear Bobby. Right. <laughs> All right, and Eric, it's rare. You know, we love repeat guests here in general, but we were, we were, uh, Greg and I were, were had a great time with you two or three years ago, where you teamed up with Bobby to share some of your expertise. Great to have you back, Eric. Yeah, thanks, guys. It, uh, as I told you, it it uh, is longer ago than I thought. It's, it feels like yesterday, so I'm glad to be back and, and glad to have the opportunity again. You seem like you're holding up pretty good after two or three extra years in the in supply chain. Somehow you yeah. survived it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I have a good team around me that you know prop me up a lot. Uh, but well, I'm here. I'm again. I'm glad to be back. Love it. You don't age a day, Eric. Goodness gracious, you need to share some of your DNA, Bobby. Uh, your practices here. Yeah, yeah. seriously. Uh, it's just me and Greg that keep uh, looking different, different. So Bobby and Eric, we'll save that for the, maybe the next episode. But uh, hey, before we get into all things domestic freight and supply chain and a lot more, we want to start with a fun warm-up question. Folks out there in the audience want to hear from you as well here. So the Grammys were held just the other night. Me and Amanda watched most of them. It's really, really lots of cool performances as always. Today happens to be the birthday of a few musical legends to include the incomparable Bob Marley, who was born in Nine Mile, Jamaica on this day back in 1945. I don't know about y'all. I'm looking forward to the upcoming uh, movie that's going to focus on his journey. It should be released very, very soon, if not already. So with that as a melodic musical backdrop, I want to ask each of y'all one of your favorite all-time musical acts. And Eric, let's start with you. Yeah, this is, I, I could go so many directions with this, uh, with, because the Grammys just happened and because uh, the esteemed William Martin Joel released his first new song in what, maybe 26 years. Uh, yeah, right. I have long been a Billy Joel fan going back to when I was a kid. I had a, a VHS tape with all of the music videos from, I think, the Innocent Man album on them. My song back then was uh, Matter of Trust. But one of, one of my favorite Billy Joel stories is when I was in fourth grade. My mom called into a local radio station in Detroit and won us tickets to go see Billy Joel and Elton John at the Pontiac Silverdome. This was wow. This was two tours ago. You know, this is everybody thought this was going to be their last tour, and I've done it a couple times since. But yeah, my mom went with a bunch of her girlfriends and and took me because I was the fan. It was pretty pretty cool. So you know, Billy Joel uh, now and forever. Man, what a story! And that, that was an interesting performance to wrap the show the other day, as I recall. Uh, all right, so Bobby, that's gonna be tough to top there, but what's one of your favorite all-time musical acts? All-time musical acts. Well, I'm a stuck in uh, 80s alternative, so I think my all-time would be uh, the band New Order. Okay. All anytime, right. Anytime. Did you ever see them in person, Bobby? I did. New Order, Public Image Limited, and uh, the group that, uh, the Sugar Cubes. Okay, man. I I, I remember the sugar cubes, uh, sugar cubes, Greg. I'm I'm new to New Order, but You're new uh, to New Order. I'm new. Where to, were hey, you in the '80s? I don't know. Yeah, hey, uh, there's some stories there, but I'll I'll digress. Uh, but Greg, all right. So good Aaron, point, Bobby. What they say about I still the had hair, so yeah, <laughs> remember <it> fondly. <laughs> but I, I do like how Bobby resides and still lives in 1980s alternative land. That's a good place to be. Uh, Greg, what about you? One of your favorite all-time musical acts. Um, God, it is so hard. Uh, you know, I used to go to concerts so much. Um, I would have to say, it's funny. I have a Billy Joel story, but I don't want to, I don't want to pile on top of Eric's, okay. um, but he was, let's put it this way. He was my neighbor in New York. So, um, and he had a favorite bar. So anyway, just one. um, I would have to say probably one of the best concerts, um, I've seen would be Van Halen. Okay. Uh, I saw him in kind of a really small venue right when they, not right when they came out, but right before they came out with 1984, when they were still playing, you know, no keyboard music. And okay. um, it was a fantastic concert. I was just a little kid. I went with one of my big cousins and it was a lot of fun, but I have mad respect for all three of, uh, I mean, all, you, you guys, selections too. a huge Billy Joel fan. That was one of the first concerts I ever went to right before my girlfriend dumped me in seventh grade. I was so hurt. Um, <laughs> crushed me right after Billy Joel. I guess she still, didn't like it as much. Still as can't I listen to just the way you are, right? It just hurts too much. <laughs> right. it. Oh, the right. You may be right. I may be crazy. Um, and of course, New Order and all of that ilk. That's, I mean, that's when I was coming up. So I love all of that music. 
So let's go. Come on. Uh, you try to sneak out of these things. <laughs> This is a fun fact where we get to learn a little bit about people. So let's learn a little bit about Scott, Scott Luton. Greg, that's, I appreciate that. And REM, I'll, I'll add to who got their start mm. in the 80s scene, in the Athens scene down the road. And of course, uh, one of the few bands I went and saw in concert at the peak of their, uh, arguably the peak of their uh, popularity on the Monster Tour back in 1994. And that was awesome. And we've been following them ever since. And my, and my kids, are, my son in particular, has started to pick up on the REM tip. So we're... Oh, that's really cool to see. That's good. Um, all right. Greg, Bobby, and Eric, are y'all ready? We're going to, speaking of 80s references, let's get into Mr. Holland's opus as we work our way through the rest oh. of the over here today. Um, all right. We've got a lot of folks. Welcome in, Lauren and Paul and Julia. Great to have everybody here. Um, okay. So we got a lot oh. to get into here today. And let's, let's tee it up on the front end. So, Bobby, uh, as we've already established, we really value – you come back with us every quarter, your insights and data-driven perspective, as does we get a lot of feedback across the globe. Uh, today, let's start with a little beyond music now, a little sneak peek of some of the takeaways that we're going to be walking through from the Q4 2023 freight payment index that we'll be diving in today. So what are a few of those things we're diving into here today, Bobby? Okay, well, uh, we're going to look at what the trends are, what important trends we're seeing in national shipping and spend volumes. We're going to look at which region in the United States saw the biggest increase in spend. And then we're going to learn what region of the country saw a drop in year over year shipments of more than 25%. Wow, more than 25%. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, folks. We're going to, again, we're going to marry Bobby and his team's data with Eric's uh, expertise and perspective out there in the marketplace. And you get Greg White's patented commentary. Come General on. General sense of wonder. A general sense of what I mean. All right. I know the answer to the drop of twenty five percent, and I'm still shocked when he says it. So true. It is so true, Greg. Yeah. Um, all right, folks out there, uh, download your own copy of this. We're dropping the link, making it really easy, one click yeah. away. You can use the link over in the chat, or you can also, if you're listening to this, you can venture over to freight.usbank.com. Okay, Greg. Before we get into, uh, I think we're going to have seven key takeaways here in just a moment. Uh, where are we going else? Uh, where else are we going with Eric and Bob before we get there? We probably ought to know what the heck these guys do and why we should listen to them, right? So, Eric, we know, but maybe you can tell some folks that haven't seen you in the last two or three years what, you're, what you do and what Total Quality Logistics does. I just, I just call it TQL. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah, you. What it says it on my shirt. It's uh, fewer syllables. We're here, you know, we're here for Bobby's number. So fewer <laughs> syllables is better. <laughs> yeah. So uh, TQL and just, I guess, to summarize the first 15 minutes or so of this to all the, you know, the younger people who are, you know, going to be the future of this industry who are hopefully here watching. I, I work with many of them, like just ask your parents, ask your parents about all that stuff. <laughs> uh, so hi, I'm Eric Olson. I'm support operations director here at TQL. We are a 3PL. We're headquartered in Cincinnati and we're a, a full service 3PL. We got our start in truckload, but we've branched out over the last few years into to every mode and we're servicing a you know variety of customers from, from Fortune 50 down to small mom and pop, uh, small businesses all over North America and, and now throughout the world as well. Mm. When I started my business, uh, when we moved into out of the basement and into the first office, I should say, in Marietta, Georgia, there was a TQL office across the street from us. So we got we got to talk to those guys firsthand at lunch, like two days a week. So it was cool to see what was going on in the industry. And because you guys are sort of everywhere, you have a real finger on the pulse of things. So, um, all right, Bobby, I, I know what you do. And of course, I think a lot of our guests know what you do. Um, and we know what the value of, of this data is, but maybe give some folks some insight on how you do it, how you analyze it, how you put it together, what you hope it represents, that, whatever yeah. you want to share. Sure. <laughs> we, um, we analyze the transaction data from over $42 billion uh, in, in spend and shipments, and we, we produce the index. It's a quarterly chain-based index. And we use it to compare basically between quarters, uh, the velocity of change in the marketplace. And again, we want to show our perspective of the marketplace. So we have our national overview as well as 
um, a regional breakdown. We see the impacts on the national level, but then we also look at the f uh, five regions and how those impacts break down and, and drive different uh, things in each of those regions. Hmm. Um, so a uh, uh, follow up question for you, Eric, and I'm going to, I'm going to share a couple of visuals uh, from uh, the Q4 freight payment index. Speak to us if you would, how do you and other business leaders like yourself, how do y'all use uh, reports and research and data like this? Well, specifically at TQL, you know, everybody's got a, a niche in the market. You have shippers, you have 3PLs, you have carriers. And, and as a 3PL, you know, we've got a little bit of shipper and a little bit of carrier in our in our daily operating model. So when we're trying to determine the price of our services and we're trying to determine strategic initiatives, you know, we're not just looking at, hey, what are our costs and what do we need to make? Or we're not looking at, hey, what's our budget and what can we spend? We're, we're, we're kind of doing both. And, and we have to do it in a way that allows us to you know service our customers uh, as well as we possibly can that allows us to be you know the choice for the carriers that want to work with us and so we have a lot of internal information but there's a lot of external information that helps us make those decisions that helps us learn about the industry what, what we really like about the u.s bank index specifically is the the number that bobby mentioned those 42 billion dollars of transactions you know that's that's real money that's going in and out the door there and, and so there's no modeling or, or anything that we need to put on that to figure out what it means. We know that this is what large shippers are spending to get their freight movement. It's, it's representative of everything moving around the country. And so it's a really valuable tool for us to understand what's happening in the market and, and then, you know, put our own work on top of it to try to figure out where it's going. Well said, Eric. And Greg, uh, when you think of, I think we've been uh, conducting this series for about four years now, if my mm -hmm. South Carolina math holds, uh, compare what we just heard there from Eric and how other business leaders that we've spoken to, and of course the folks we hear back between the shows, how they use research. Yeah, well, when you're providing a service to the industry like Eric and his crew do, it's, you know, it, it provides a lot of, the, of immediate insight, but what a lot of the shippers try to do is get an idea of what they ought to be budgeting for shipping. That's one thing that they're trying to figure out and which direction it's going, what the availability is gonna be in various regions depending on what it, what part of the industry that they're in. Um, so there's just so much that you can figure out. I mean, we've, we've had companies who build their budget off of that, um, who, who uh, inform their contract carriers based on, based on that, or, you know, or even start to look at whether they're going to use spot or contract, all, all kinds of things because of what they perceive as the trends or the flux or the stability of the industry. Um, so there, I mean, there's a ton of things that, that you can do with it. And we've heard, you know, a lot of companies share how they use this. It's, you know, it's, it is, I know Bobby can't say this, but it is helpful. It's not predictive data, but it is helpful in predicting what could be coming because you can look at the past because the chain based nature of it, and you can see that there is a trend and, and there's also not just data, but all this explanation around the data in, in the report that allows you to discern for, using your own judgment as to whether you think that those conditions will continue, whether, whether they'll exacerbate or they'll start to fade or, or whatever. So, um, you know, it's more than just data and, right. but the data is what informs all of that, that additional information. Well said. And I love the word, we love the word discern such a powerful and important approach here in 2024. Okay. Hey, two quick things. And then we're going to jump right into the key takeaways with Bobby and then get Eric and Greg's commentary on those seven things. But first we talked music. We got to add Josh's take here, warp tour, Lincoln park and Santana. Actually, I, I bet Lincoln park and Santana were on the warped tour is my thought there. Josh, correct me if I'm wrong and let us know how cool that concert tour was. What uh, a great, what a great day of music that is music that is decidedly gen X right? Lincoln Park, but also Santana, which was our parents generation from the sixties hey, 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 hey. and still ripping it today, man. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Okay. And then the second thing I want to share right before we get into key takeaways, just again, I shared this a second ago, give you all a sense there. Greg was talking about historical looking Pat looking, um, in, in the, in history and help bring that context forward as we identify where we're headed. It's so important. So the U.S. Bank Freight Payment Index, uh, two core measurements, shipment activity, uh, shipment volume and spend volume, right? So you'll hear us talk about that quite a bit. And then secondly, as you'll see in a minute, it also dives into 
uh, one, two, three, four, five different regions, right? So you get national information and you get uh, more local and regionalized information, which I think is one of the biggest parts of the value here today. Okay, Greg and Bobby and Eric, uh, I think this, the table is now set. The table is now set. So Bobby, as we start to dive more into the seven key takeaways from the Q4 uh, freight payment index. Uh, what's the first one as it relates to national shipment volume? Well, as uh, people no doubt saw from the, the chart that you showed, uh, we had double digit drops in both shipments and spend. And this was like the first time uh, we had both of those dropping in double digits since Q1 2019. Uh, so it's just an interesting indication of uh, where we've been. Agreed. Agreed. So, uh, Eric, when you get that first bullet point, first of the seven key takeaways, what are you seeing? How, how, how does that square with what, what you and TQL team are seeing? Yeah, I mean, that that matches our experience pretty much spot on. And, and of all the unpredictable things that have happened over the last few years, really, that number was was kind of predictable. You know, as we saw what the market was doing, uh, as you read about demand and, and inventories in, in the larger economy. Um, I, I think it was no no surprise to us that that was, that that was the impact. Of course, the question, and we'll talk about it later, is, is going to be, where does it go? Does it continue? Mm -hmm. What does it mean? But yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly how it felt here on, on the ground. Good points there, uh, Eric. All right, Greg, your thoughts? I think of the great philosopher, Plover Lang. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's... It's been a strange, strange time, not solely impacted by what's going on in the States, of course, with everything that's happening in the Red uh, Sea and all of that area there, mm -hmm. right? So, um, but yeah, it's been a strange and I, I think for a lot of companies, painful time. I mean, I have occasion to talk, we, you know, we, we know the CEO, Vector Global Logistics, uh, um, and we know um, a ton of, of actual trucking company leaders. Um, and I, I think, I think they're, they seem encouraged though. They feel like they are through the, the sort of depths of the pain, at least the four or five that I've talked to feel like they're through that. But, um, it, I mean, they, the stories that they have and that they've shared over the time, you know, over the last quarter has been, um, eerie in some cases, not Lake Erie. Either. Right. <laughs> hey, I love it, Greg. Whenever Clever Lang, the the one and only Clever Lang, makes uh, an appearance in in our business conversations, and was that Rocky two or three? I always get them confused. I think that was Rocky two, right? Yeah, I think it was two. Yeah. Okay. All right. Love it. Yeah. Uh, all right. So that's just the first. We got six more to go. So Bobby, now moving from shipment uh, shipment volumes to spend volumes on a national basis. What's the second key takeaway there? Well, what's, uh, the second key takeaway is in national spend. The 1.4% drop was the smallest decline in the last three quarters. And again, you can kind of see that when you, you balance that or, or map that against the double-digit drop in shipments, you can kind of see that uh, costs were staying higher than, than normal for, uh, for that time period. So, again, interesting, interesting set of numbers. Absolutely. And, you know, folks that download, well, actually, folks that have their finger on the pulse of what's been going on across really global supply chains, certainly domestic supply chains, and uh, on a more targeted level, folks that have downloaded the, the Q4 freight payment index, uh, you should know, you know inventory reduction, right? Normalize, trying to normalize inventory. That's been a, a big push. In fact, Greg, Bobby, and Eric, according to the Census Bureau, the ratio of inventories to sales when it comes to you know, general merchandise stores in fourth quarter 2023, well, it's getting closer and closer to where the ratio was pre-pandemic. Get this, hmm. November 2023, that ratio was 1.36. And in November 2019, it was 1.33. Getting getting closer. You hear a lot more uh, companies re-embracing just in time once again. We knew that happened though. Um, okay. So when it comes to the national spend, Eric, your comments there on what, what you're seeing out in the marketplace, especially when you compare them and contrast what Bobby just shared. 
uh, again, similar. I think there's probably a little bit of seasonality there. You know, we, we kind of expect the, the spend to be a little stronger in Q4. Uh, but as the market downturn has has just lasted and, and worsened, you know, I don't think it's any secret that unfortunately we have a, a lot of transportation companies that aren't aren't able to stay open that are that are shuttering. There have been, you know, some pretty notable names in the news in that regard. But there have been, you know, thousands and thousands of, of smaller companies that have gone out of the market, unfortunately. And, and you know, it, it is very simple supply and demand when it comes to spend in a lot of cases. And so I think that we're, we're starting to see the impact of that it sort of prop up the spend a little more than the shipment volume. Mm, thank you, Eric. Greg? Yeah, I think I, I'm. Uh, I, I see a lot of the effect in the retail environment, right? I mean, Americans are running out of other taxpayers' money. That three point one trillion dollars that we pumped into the, you know, into the economy is running out, and um, I think a part of the inventory decline was retailers anticipating a decline in sales. They predicted an, an, a, a lower um, than average. Um, peak season. I always want to say holiday. We can't even say holiday anymore. Um, peak season. And, um, and I, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but I, I still think of 2021 and early 2022 when you couldn't get a bargain on anything. Everything was full price or more. And now I've started to see retailers promoting sales and I mean, sale prices. Um, you know, I started seeing that probably around the middle of the year with, um, with discretionary and, and luxury goods, but it's really coming into the mainstream now. Uh, you can tell that consumer um, activity is is tailing, and consumer sentiment is is that they expect harder times in the economy. So uh, that had a big effect on on what we saw moving around the country and the world. Excellent points there. Excellent points. Okay. We're going to be making a shift now in these seven key takeaways. So in the first couple, we really uh, dove more into national trends, uh, shipping and spending. And now we're going to do just like we talked about, move into the each of these five regions that uh, the U.S. Bank Freight Payment Index focuses on. Uh, and again, freight.usbank.com to download your own free copy of this quarterly uh, information. Okay. So, Bobby, starting with the West, we're going to kind of fl- um, mix it up a bit. A lot of times we'll start in the Northeast, but oh, no, we're going to start way out there in the West today for our third key takeaway. Your thoughts? Well, the West experienced the smallest quarterly drop in shipments, which was about 2.9% of the five regions. And uh, this may be attributable to a, a, a pickup in uh, port, uh, port entry uh, Port shipments or port imports. I'm sorry. Good grief. In a moment. <laughs> I'm, doing I'm, doing I'm sorry, Bobby. I messed you up, man. <laughs> yeah, imports. Um, uh, import volumes are up slightly in the West, and then, but then we also balance that with soft retail sales, and it's one of the largest economies in the country. So, uh, any movement there is going to uh, have impacts that that ripple across the country. So, um, yeah. flat. Flat interest in demand in sales and demand for manufactured goods impacted this region. Mm. Okay. Uh, Eric, out west, what are you and the TQL team seeing? Yeah, I think that uh, that's really evidence of of what we've been talking about, that these inventory drawdowns that had been going on over the last several quarters um, are, you know, getting stable right like the west coast is is impacted by that the most here in the us a lot of stuff is coming across from asia and so i think the the decline there has more to do with with activity in the previous quarters than than really anything tangible we did we saw you know we saw imports pick up the way we usually do but not to the extent that we have over the last few years because again we've got you know a lot of retailers a lot of other uh, types of businesses have their inventories where they want them and i think that's exactly that's exactly why you see that low number there excellent point eric greg yeah, we're also seeing, um, you know, sort of a drawdown of, of fall and winter goods and and peak season goods um, as they build into spring at a retail level. Um, so that's that's going to have an impact. I think, you know, as I said earlier, as everyone said now, that, that um, everybody was very conservative and they were drawing down goods. Scott, think about this. I just think about this, Eric, while you were talking is, not that I wasn't listening, Eric. It was fascinating. 
<laughs> no, but you made me think of you made me think of this situation. It was about this time last year that Roomba got a or I robot got a huge shipment of Roombas that were supposed to arrive in November because of port congestion. They arrived after Christmas. So if you bought a Roomba at Christmas this year, you bought last year's model. Hmm. Um, but you probably got a pretty good deal on it. And it and it is that kind of because people missed so big at the end of 2022. Remember, we had we had the huge overstocks of patio furniture, which I ruthlessly took advantage of. We had um, all kinds of appliances and all sorts of things with long, long lead times where they expected last holiday season to hit the way the previous, the end of 2021. And yet, and it, and it did in large measure, but they could not get the goods here because of port congestion. So now we have much less port congestion. Scott, I was just monitoring the global Hilton Head port backup index from uh, for, to Savannah and Charleston. And that, that's the official name. Please write that down, people. Um, and there were only like seven, seven ships and all of them were moving. I mean, wow. you know, within within just a moments of literally it felt like of, of anchoring offshore. So uh, it's a different world than it was. And it's hard to think about it. It's that seems like so long ago, all that port congestion, but that really impacted this entire year. Yeah, no, Greg, just to, you know, I, I, the example I use is in 2021, we ordered a new refrigerator in April and got it in August. And uh, this, this past week, like a week, the week before last, my neighbor's uh, oven broke and they had to get a new oven and they went to the, went to Lowe's, excuse me, went to the retailer on Wednesday and they, they had it delivered on Friday. So it's definitely a, a much different world. It's a new world. I mean, it's an old world, right? Mm. Well, um, it, it's fascinating. It, it feels in the moment back there in the height of the pandemic, we're moving so slowly, but gosh, you, you blink and to y'all's point, it is a much different world right now. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So Bobby, if I'm not correct me, if I'm wrong, I think we, that all that commentary was just on the West. If I, if I'm following along at home, so let's get into the Southwest Bobby. Yeah. The Southwest um, was interesting. It was the strongest performing region in 2022 and the first half of 2023. But it also, uh, we saw that double digit drop from the previous quarter. It was 18.2% drop in shipment, um, shipment velocity, um, but it was only down 2.7% in spend. Again, showing that uh, correlation between uh, indication of capacity issues yeah. uh, and higher costs for shipping, on yep. smaller amounts of shipping. Yep. Uh, all right, Eric, in the Southwest, does the song remain the same? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I think uh, one thing that's important to remember about um, even even these regional indexes that in a, in a given business, how, you know, your customer mix, it might be dramatically different. So you know, we, didn't, we didn't see quite uh, the same movement in the Southwest. But, you know, I, I think if, if you read, uh, you know, download, and read the index, uh, U.S. Bank identified uh, home, home sales and, and some cross border things is uh, impacting that a ton. Well, you know, if, if you're moving a lot of food and bev and, and, and retail that, you know, can help strengthen it a little bit. So, so we see in the, in the sectors that are named in the index, we kind of saw the same thing, but again, our experience was a, a, a little bit different there. And we've, you know, we've seen so much of that throughout the last couple of years where we're looking uh, as, as small scale as possible, sometimes tells you a lot more than the national averages do, because in, in a lot of cases, our experience can be tremendously different than what, what the whole country or even regions do. Yeah. Excellent point, Eric, uh, Gregory. Yeah, it goes all the way down to industry, right? I mean, because different industries require different kinds of, of carriers or trailers or whatever, right? So, um, and region makes sense because there are so many regional carriers. It, it is um, a truly five different markets, uh, you know, because of the regional industry impacts. And we're, that's what we see so much of in this, uh, you know, as we break this down, it is that impact of the respective industry areas as well as geographical regions of the of the country yeah. um it's 18.3 or isn't it though that's, oh, that's a lot <laughs> <There you go. clears throat> um and you know to the housing situation i think we're going to continue to see that impact because housing has slowed down 
housing sales have slowed down dramatically, including um, new home sales. Believe me, I can verify. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As somebody with a house for sale, <laughs> anyone out there, please want to buy a beautiful little house in a great school district. Just okay. shoot me a note. Shoot Greg. Not beautiful shoot. Marietta, Georgia. So. <laughs> shoot Greg White a note. Uh, all right. Love Shameless we, marketing. No, Shameless okay. marketing plug. All right. A lot of stuff going on. Uh, and, and you're right. The housing market. Goodness gracious. We could mm. do a six hour show and just uh, top of the iceberg of what's going on there. Well, and the waterfall uh, effect of that is incredible. Like Eric's talking about. Right. That's right. I mean, it is. It's things like refrigerators and stoves and couches and, and all of that. Right. That's right. Um, all right. So, Bobby. Let's shift over to the Midwest, one of our favorite regions to dive into. What, what did you see there? Well, the Midwest um, was down 8.6% um, over the third quarter in, <clears throat> excuse me, shipments, but it had the only um, rise, 1.2% increase in spend. So, again, a lot of uh, uh, this one, per Greg's previous commentary on housing starts, yeah. Midwest saw uh, an increase in housing starts hmm. um, from the third quarter. So again, the regional influences are different and those things that are impacting the nation register differently depending on which region you're in. And this one, uh, this one was up on spend. That's right. Uh, housing, uh, to y'all's point, certainly one of those uh, big things to keep your finger on the pulse of that has those ripple effects. Manufacturing, a lot of folks, when they think of the Midwest, I think of manufacturing. Uh, Greg, we tackled this in the buzz the other day. Several reports are showing increased activity in the manufacturing sector, both domestically and abroad, as well as increased new orders. That's good news. A lot of analysts are pointing to March or April 2024, though, before we're seeing new positive growth in the space. As we mentioned the other day, Greg, yeah. manufacturing activity is not expanding. It is just contracting more slowly. That's so right. we look forward to next uh, the next couple of months when we get a, a full positive outlook on where we are. Um, all right. So Eric, in the Midwest, your thoughts? Well, I think that the, the thing that stands out to me here is, is we've got shipments down and we've got spend up, right? And I think that's in part a direct reflection of the shipment volumes being down so much on the West Coast. There's only one direction for things to go from the West Coast and that's and that's East. And so the stuff that's coming out of the Midwest, you're, you're getting a lot of carriers that are domiciled in that area that are kind of head hauling and ounce that are taking advantage of the backhaul or taking advantage of, of building a network. And then I, I think that's another place where the that decrease in capacity um, has been kind of the most noticeable. And, and I think they've been operating at a capacity deficit in that region for for a long time. And, you know, this is anecdotal and this is true of a few places. But if you you know if you drive so I'm here in Cincinnati, if you drive from Cincinnati to Chicago, when you get near Chicago, you see billboards advertising carriers that are hiring everywhere. And, and mm -hmm. it's been that way for a while. So I, I think that, you know, there was a, a, a lack of capacity just overall in that area. I think that the carriers have been driven out of the market sort of exacerbated that. And I think that's how you get uh, a, you know, fairly significant decline in shipments, but, but an increase in spend. Yeah. Good, good points there, Eric. Great points. Uh, Greg, one of your favorite regions, the Midwest, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, a couple of really great insights there. It is capacity, but it's not capacity of equipment. It's capacity of drivers. And um, it I mean, it is to some extent, and in some markets it is. But two of the five happy uh, trucking company owners that I talked to are in the Midwest. And they're like, we just can't find enough drivers. And we can't we can't fulfill all the loads that are coming our way. So this is, you know, that's the inflation effect of of the demand and supply balance curve, whatever you want to call it, um, relationship. And, uh, you know, rates, we've seen it here in, in every region effectively. And Scott, to your point, it, with manufacturing, it's not that more units are being manufactured, it's that they're being manufactured at a higher cost. Mm. So um, while the myth is that, that uh, inflation is, is, I think people perceive that inflation is coming down. It's not. Inflation is just going up, just the inverse of what we talked about with manufacturing. It's going up at a lesser rate than it was before. It's no longer going up at 9 or 16%. It's now it's only going up at 3.7%, which is still substantial, Yes. by the way. It only takes 
at, at the current rate, it takes less than three years to double the price of everything. So yes. um, it, you know, that's an important, or sorry, less than two years. That's an important thing for us to get perspective on. And that's why we continue to see this, you know, this, the, the shipment value increase more than the, than the, I'm uh, sorry, the dollar value increase more than the shipment count value. You have me the whole time. Uh, excellent. Right up till the end there where I, you know, <laughs> but lots of pain here, lots of pain still in the wallet. And ain't uh, no joke. Imagine if you've got to, you got to right, you got to get a dry van to, you know, from Omaha, Nebraska to California. Right. right. Cause I mean, if you're in Omaha, Nebraska, I'm sure you want to get out. <laughs> well, beautiful, going back to your point, is <laughs> go back to your point, Greg, uh, and going back to that manufacturing data, not only, yeah, we, we, we saw a little more activity. We saw a new orders, uh, increase, but to your point, we saw, uh, or a raw material price, raw, uh, pricing that manufacturers are purchasing is still going up. Right. So lots and lots of, of things to balance. Um, all right. So that was the Midwest. Uh, Bobby Holland, let's talk about the Northeast. Your thoughts? Well, the Northeast um, is the smallest region, but because of the population density, it uh, moves like, if you will, like a, like a bigger region. And uh, one of the things that stands out up here is changes in consumer spending and retail sales um, you know, amplify uh, changes in ship and shipping and spend. So the shipment index contracted just under 10% from the third quarter. Um, and the spend was down 2.5%. Again, that capacity, uh, uh, registered on capacity, but again, consumer spending was moderated in, in the fourth quarter, in the fourth quarter, um, non-auto retail sales declined and manufacturing activity appears softened. And again, same with New England, um, restaurant sales moderated and clothing retails reported softer sales. So those changes in consumer spending, you can see the effects of it and the impacts on the shipments and spend. Mm. Well said, Bobby. Eric, the Northeast, your thoughts? I think it's similar to uh, the West Coast and that you, you saw, you know, it's important to look at the quarter over quarter numbers because I think you're seeing the the inventory right sizing reflected there. If you look at the, the warehouse real estate market in that area, if we look at kind of how our business trended there, uh, it, it's clear that, you know, the right amount of product is is in stores and in, in warehouses there, whereas you know, there, there wasn't enough and, and then there was, there was too much. And it seems like everybody's again, kind of, kind of back to a stasis. So I, I look at this, the Northeast as another place where I'm, I'm very interested to see what happens over the next couple quarters. Yes, we are too. Greg, your thoughts. I think we might be giving the retailers too much credit for balancing their inventory. My concern is that they are <clears throat> low on the things that are really popular, which is common. And they're, chock full of the slower moving goods. Uh, that is not an infrequent um, happenstance in retail because they still, to this day, don't use sophisticated enough methods to manage their inventory. They just basically drop everything, which includes their fastest movers, and particularly in the industries that Bobby and Eric have talked about that are impacted, cars, clothing, things like that. They, they just do sort of a wholesale drawdown and and what that does is that puts their most popular products at greater risk. So we could see we could see a backlash from that in the future if if they have continued to do that. And I suspect and know in some cases that they have. You've got to think about the fact, too, that Macy's, which we talked about on Monday, is going bankrupt yet again um, and and um, lar largely because of how they manage their merchandising and manage their inventory. And that's a a huge impact in the Northeast, right? Mm. Particularly department and luxury stores in the, in the Northeast have a huge, huge impact because, well, that's where the, all the money is. So, <laughs> uh, so that, you know, that, that um, I, I think, I think the drawdown is what's happening. I think it's going to have a, a backlash effect because I, I'm only, again, only guessing only my opinion that they are continuing to, to do these sort of wholesale inventory shifts that don't account for the fact that some items are far more popular th than others and they ought to carry more units 
same time supply, but more units. Um, so, you know, I think that's something to look to the future for and see how that impacts uh, shipments. In the case of the shipping industry, it could be a good thing that they're right. that inefficient, right? right? Because they will have to have those faster moving goods come in and and in a rush as well. So, yep. which is going to raise the price, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah, I think we saw in the lead up to to COVID, we saw you know so much more data enter the industry. Um, so many you know really sophisticated providers who were making really good use of data enter the industry, and and I think that did it lulled a lot of shippers to sleep, thinking, oh cool, we have this we have this information now, we've got to figure it out. Well, obviously the, the pandemic and the, the period after that threw that totally out of whack. To your point, Greg, I'll, I'll be curious as you know as we talk to customers and and work on you know work on planning for the future with them if, if we're going to see some more of that a little bit too much comfort comfort with the data that's out there because we we don't know we haven't we haven't figured out how to predict this yet and i think that the worst mistake that you know a company like ours or, or any other can make is is being convinced that you completely understand what's happening right um, and and not you know building in flexibility and and taking in as much contrary uh viewpoints as you can to try to make good decisions so eric i love what you threw out there as you were responding to Greg and Bobby's commentary, sitting down and planning with your customers. That is what's old is new and powerful. Again, I love that, Eric. Okay. We got one more to go. And by the way, Andre, Tomcat, Kazan, uh, Six Sigma, uh, Lauren, many others. Uh, Y'all keep, keep comments coming. We even got a supply chain haiku in here from. I Tom saw Cat. that. Yes. Yeah. Um, all right. We got one more takeaway to go, and then we're going to get some, forward projections from Greg and Eric, not from Bobby, but from Greg and Eric. And then we're going to make sure folks know how to connect with our speakers and download their own copy of the Q4 2023 U.S. Bank Freight Payment Index. So all of this, Bobby, leads up to the seventh key takeaway, which is the southeastern region, the U.S. Southeast. What do you see there? We saw the largest year-over-year -year drop in shipments in this region with 25.4%. Uh, it was the largest of, among the five regions. Uh, from a quarterly perspective, it was down 14.5% uh, in shipment volume and 4.1% on spend. Uh, this was interesting because uh, diesel prices are lower, but yet, you know, the, you can see the, the disparity in between shipments and spend. Um, but here, uh, the Southeast is like normally tour, tourists, and you would expect uh, you know, things to be buoyed up by retail sales, but retail sales softened uh, in the first half of this quarter. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I just, huh. can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, we, we got, got Bobby. You. Okay, right. gotcha. Hey, I think the slow is piling up on your cable housing. line. Yeah, slow housing demand as well. So, again, those things um, help to, to drop the shipments, but from a capacity perspective, we can see that uh, the ship uh, spend uh, was a lot less. The drop in spend was a lot less than the um, shipment. So, yep. Good stuff there, Bobby. Thank you so much. And hey, uh, I hope that seven and a half feet of snow that you were talking about in the pre-show isn't still sticking around. Goodness gracious, that interferes with everything we're talking about, doesn't it? But uh, yeah, yeah. good stuff there. Seven key takeaways from Bobby Holland. Okay, before we go, Eric. And Greg, y'all comment quickly on anything y'all saw in the Southeast, and then we're going to get y'all's forward-looking prediction. Eric? Yeah, uh, I think that what you see there is is the, and Bobby alluded to one, and we talked about another earlier, is, is really the end of a couple of booms, right? The post-COVID travel peak, a lot of tourism to the South, that that kind of slows down. There's less need for the stock and supplies that, that you know, feed and entertain those tourists when that slows down. And the, the housing market, I mean, you know, the, the, it's no... Um, coincidence, I don't think that the places where the the uh, shipments are down so much year over year, quarter over quarter, are those places where there were tremendous housing booms during and, and after COVID. And really, I mean, long, long term trend of the population moving there. For for us, this is going to be really interesting to see in the next couple of quarters because the Southeast tends to be really volatile seasonally throughout the year. And so, from a, a 3PL perspective, we we tend to uh, we tend to be pretty strong there, shipment count wise. Yeah. And so I'm curious to see if if 
uh, that reflects in, you know, uh, new new awards that we have and continued business that we have with our customers or, or how that changes based on this. Yeah. Speaking of awards, looks like you and the team walked away with several Grammys the other night right there behind you. That is cool to see. And also speaking of business, before I co- you, to come to you, Greg, speaking of business, South Carolina alone, the Palmetto State, you're talking about manufacturing and activity and maybe what lies ahead. 15 manufacturers have announced expansions in recent months, which is supposed to create over 3,000 new jobs. So we'll see. So South Carolina's been do- doing a great job. Teach you all as well. We've, we're expanding the offices there too. So Wonderful, Eric. That's great to hear. Um, all right. So, Greg, lots of good news here as we start to wrap. Greg, when it comes to the Southeast or, or a key takeaway in general from all that we've covered over the last uh, 30 minutes or so, your thoughts, Greg? So much of it depends on how the – how the um, the economy lands, right? There's a question in the comments about do we want inflation or not? Um, that's a bigger philosophical discussion. Andre, I will refer you to Ray Dalio's book, which is Principles for Dealing with the Changing World Order. There is a breaking point wherein inflation destroys an economy and uh, not probably not in our lifetime, but uh, we are re- reaching that breaking point in the mm. states but um so back to the topic at hand um you know i mean I, I think how this economy lands and whether it's a soft landing or a hard landing or some people are talking about a goldilocks scenario and a goldilocks scenario is where we basically corral inflation without stagnating the economy it's going to be hard uh, because there are so many small, medium businesses and so many real estate investors like Blackstone who have invested billions in these whole neighborhoods mm. that are rental properties, right? They bought the homes to rent them out. And now people want to buy homes again. And at, and and their interest rates are being set periodically. So these properties that they bought at, at near zero interest rates are getting very, very expensive for them. And they're locked into leases wherein they can't um, they can't raise the rent for some period of time. So that's going to come home to roost in the last half of this year. And we could see a flood on the market of, of homes sold by, by hedge funds and, yeah. and uh, big investment firms and things like that. So um, there's a lot of prediction around, around commercial real estate and the collapse that was supposed to happen this year. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know these things, but there are a lot of things to look at and that, but the point is that that a lot of that will drive how how the supply chain is impacted, not just in shipments, but in general demand overall. Yeah, well said there, Greg. And, and Andre, thanks for the comments and questions. Check out that book and get back to us. Great always to have you on our live streams. All right, Eric. Yeah, also, I'm not against deflation. I'm not against it. Okay. I mean, Let- Prices have, we've seen it happen before. We saw it happen in, you know, after the housing crisis in right. 2008, 2009, right? I remember when a Zach's snack was 349 <laughs> and now it's 895. <laughs> we need the, just like the, the Fed has a press conference, we're going to have a Greg White press conference on economic <laughs> policy soon. Um, all right. Not an economist. Sorry, I have to give my disclaimer, Scott. Not an econ- economist, but right. Everybody as they are. Yeah, you fooled you never. fooled me. Uh, you you totally you totally fooled me. Oh, Eric, Eric, <laughs> Eric. We, I'll tell you, we have a lot of fun on these conversations. Great to have you and Bobby and Greg back with us. Eric, uh, Greg just kind of shared some things of what, that's what's happening now and things that kind of keep your keep your eye on moving forward. Let's ask you as well, Eric, when it comes to the in, in particular the freight market, what are you expecting the months ahead? So I've got three three points here. The first is is that you know every um, every fundamental that that we look at kind of says that we're probably near the the bottom of the rate environment. Now, again, not an economist. I'm not even not even Greg. I mean, so asterisk <laughs> supply. Um, but you know, we expect that over the next couple of quarters that that you know uh, transportation costs will probably start to rise. So that's point number one. Point number two, um, I can't remember, again, I'm, I'm really citing Greg as a source an awful lot. I should be citing Bobby here. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm probably going to regret this. But um, I, whatever <laughs> Definitely the, not me. the Hilton Head Charleston Container Shipping Index or whatever, yes. um, my, my mom just got back from a, a South America cruise where she went through the Panama Canal. And so the my mom's vacation photo <laughs> ship sitting on water index is, is tremendously high. 
Really? And, you know, that that's that's obviously in the news. She was delayed by a day going through the canal on her on her cruise because of the water levels. Um, and so that's going to create disruptions. It's going to create yep. disruptions here, you know, here in the U.S. And, and throughout the world. And when the the ocean line got really out of whack before we saw what that did to, to pretty much pretty much everything. So I think that's that's another um, item to watch. The third thing. Back, back to, to Bobby, to, again, the, the person about whom we should be talking here. The one um, with actual knowledge, I'm, right, Eric? Yeah, I mean, look, um, well, I you know, guys have the actual know. knowledge. I'm just getting numbers. Just the, sorry, yes, the, the, qual the quality data. We'll call it the quality data. There you go. Um, the, I, I will be very interested to see what the spend and shipment count numbers do over the next couple of quarters on the index, because I, I think that there's a possibility that the movement of those could lie to us a little. One of uh, my responsibilities here is for our truckload pricing team, and we're seeing a significant increase year over year in the amount of bids and the amount of lanes that are coming in to bid for us. So we're seeing a lot of shippers trying to capitalize their pricing on, on what is maybe the bottom of the market now. And so contract rates are going to get locked in very low because the competitive environment is really not reflective of the forecast, right? What do you need to do to win the freight now is, is what a lot of uh, companies are looking to do. And so I think that because we're seeing so many bids, we're going to see contract rates be very low. Right. And I think that's going to be reflected in the spend for large shippers, many of whom are U.S. bank customers. I think that that may not be an indicator of what shipment volumes are going to do. And I, and I think that when those two lines really, really cross is when you're going to see a, a change in the, the spend environment. Well said. Excellent three points to wrap on there in terms of what's to come. And we're right up against the end of our time together. And I hate that, Greg, Bobby, and Eric. Really enjoyed the conversation here today. But a couple final questions. So, so Bobby, for, for uh, starters, and we've dropped it in the chat. We've, we've dropped it in the, uh, the visuals here today. Uh, let's make sure folks know how to find the U.S. Bank Freight Payment Index, but also connect with you, Bobby. How can folks do that? Uh, well, my LinkedIn information is up to date, so you can connect with me uh, through my information there. And you can get the uh, index at freight.usbank.com. Subscrip subscription, sign up, and you'll get it delivered quarterly to your mailbox. Wonderful. Email box. It is just that easy. And mm -hmm. of course, you can find Bobby back with us uh, next quarter. I really have enjoyed these series. A lot of folks uh, uh, informing and educating and, and arming folks with really good data driven insights and perspective. Really appreciate what Bobby Holland and the team does. Uh, Eric Olson, man, TQL has been on the move, expanding, growing, planning, conquering, you name it. Uh, if I heard their new business line, Total quality data. Who knows? A new subsidiary coming from our friends at TQL. Just kidding. Just kidding. Eric, how can folks connect with you and your, your team? Uh, Scott, I've been here for for eighteen years, and the company's grown and changed a lot. So I wouldn't I wouldn't rule out anything. Um, I you know I again like Bobby, uh, my LinkedIn information is is up to date, um, and and so if, if you want to reach out, please please do. I you know I'll be at uh, the TIA conference in April. Uh, I will be at the American Chemistry Council Responsible Care Conference in, in May. And, and you know, I uh, consider it my job to learn as much as I can from as many smart people in the industry as I can. Um, that's why we like the U.S. Bank Freight Index. That's why we like, you know, talking to you guys and, and, and anybody that we can to, to help, you know, help each other figure this stuff out. So thanks. Thanks for having me. This has been great, guys. I yeah, agree. I appreciate it. Thanks yeah. for your insights. Um, all right. Well, we got to leave it there. Greg, stay tuned. I am going to quickly get one of your patent key takeaways. But first, we're going to thank again Bobby Holland, Director of Freight and Business Analytics at U.S. Bank, and Eric Olson, <laughs> Sales Support Operations Director with Total Quality Logistics, a.k.a. TQL. Thank you, Eric and Bobby, for being here. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks guys. Hey, hey, Greg, that, what a great hour. What a great hour. And I wish I had. Did we actually get 60 minutes? It doesn't feel like it. I mean, <laughs> those are it's... short hours. I think we're getting gypped a few minutes here. The suits. The suits keep squeezing us. Wherever the suits are, they're squeezing us. But, the uh, commercials. but man, Bobby and Eric brought it. And I really enjoyed yeah. the three of y'all, your commentary and, and analysis. So if you had to boil it all down to one thing, Greg, that folks need to take away from this conversation. What would that be, Gregory? Yeah, and this struck me as we were talking towards the end of the show. It is that while the freight payment index is right on top of what's happening in, in the shipment marketplace, 
one of the things we need to acknowledge and identify, because Eric was talking about planning and he was talking about, you know, using that to plan with your trading partners. We have to acknowledge that the, that shipments and that aspect of supply chain is a lagging, not leading indicator. And it's driven by the leading indicators like home sales, like manufacturing volume, like um, retail sales and and all of those sorts of things that tell us the direction that the economy and that demand is going, which then informs the, the methodologies that retailers and manufacturers need to use to acquire inventory, which then requires freight and shipment, sh freight and shipments yes. to, to move those goods. So understand that you have to inform yourself with all that other information while you're planning, because as Eric said, you know, you have to have those insights with your trading partners of what's happening with them and what you expect to be happening with them to see that part of the future to help you meld that with this incredibly rich and valuable data to tell you what the future is going to look like. It's I, I mean, it's why Bobby really can't tell us the future, right? right? Because there's additional data that's required to do that. Make sure if you're using this thing, you are you are working with your trading partners. That's right. And hey, uh, uh, furthering that point and very eloquently said, uh, Greg, it's just that easy. What Greg just said, do that and you'll have lots of business success. But hey, if you're using the U.S. Bank Freight Payment Index, let us know what your favorite part uh, from the most recent uh, publication was. Or if you're not using it, check it out today and let us know your favorite part of how you can really put it into action. And then secondly, just to throw one more thing out there and double down, I love what Greg just talked about there about being informed, a more informed business leader, a more informed team, organization, and then sitting down with your trading partners, your customers, and planning how you're going to make everyone successful in the months to come in this these crazy disruptive environments, which, by the way, they've always been that way, as Greg likes to point out. So whatever you do, find good resources and lean on them. Um, okay, Greg White, always a pleasure to knock out these conversations with you. Likewise, always great to work with you, which we do frequently, but also it's great. I feel like Bobby is like our second host or third yeah. host on this thing now, right? I mean, he need we can always count on him to bring it. That's right. Um, and now, man, I'm, I feel like I'm going to have to up my fashion game. If he's going to be <laughs> dressing like that all the time. Well, uh, you're really... going to have to get some new fancy quarter zips. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> break break the bank. Well, hey, uh, I agree with you. Bobby and Eric, such a pleasure with both of these gentlemen here today. Greg, always a pleasure knocking it out with you. Hey, folks, thanks for being here. Thanks. I know we couldn't get everybody's comment here today, but again, the challenge is simple. It's about deeds, not words. Take something that was shared here today and put it in action. Your teams will be grateful. And with that said, mm. on behalf of our entire team here at Supply Chain Now, Scott Luton challenging you to do good, to give forward, and to be the change. And we'll see you next time right back here at Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody.